Hello and welcome to KQED Newsroom. I'm Twee Vu. Coming up on our program, veteran PBS anchor Bill Moyers joins us to talk about the state of politics and media and his latest documentary on mass incarceration. Plus, renowned French chef and TV personality Jacques Pepin returns to KQED to reflect on a scrumptious career celebrating his love of cooking. But first, today, more California lawmakers raise the possibility of impeaching the president. Congressman Mark Desonier of Concord and Ted Lieu of Los Angeles both say it's time to look at the process for removing Trump from office. Meanwhile, CNN is reporting White House lawyers have begun researching impeachment procedures. This caps a week of bombshell political developments. On Monday, the Washington Post reported that President Trump had disclosed highly classified intelligence information to Russian envoys during a White House meeting last week. Then, on Tuesday, came the explosive news that Trump had reportedly urged FBI Director James Comey to end the federal investigation of Michael Flynn before he fired Comey last week. On Wednesday, the Justice Department named former FBI Director Robert Mueller as special counsel to lead the probe into Russian meddling in the 2016 presidential race. Joining me now with analysis are UC Berkeley political science professor Stephen Fish, who joins us via Skype from Moscow, Hoover Institution Research Fellow Corey Shockey, joining us from Stanford University campus. Corey, let's begin with you. President Trump left today for his first uh, foreign trip, nine days, that include stops in Saudi Arabia, Israel, and Italy. You recently wrote an article titled The Bonfire of Donald Trump's Vanities, and in it you say that he has become an international liability. Can you explain that? Yeah, I think the domestic turmoil of the president, of how the president is choosing to do his job, creates three kinds of problems for him internationally. The first is um, the allies are nervous. They don't know what to expect. They're accustomed to the United States being a calming force internationally, not a disruptive one. And so allies are worried about whether they should be hedging their bets against him. And that's actually not in America's interest. The second cost his behavior is imposing is allies not wanting to associate themselves with a president that seems not to um, be an ardent supporter of the rule of law. And so you see, for example, German Chancellor Angela Merkel inviting former President Obama to Germany, to Berlin, to speak right in advance of the NATO summit because she wants to associate herself with the United States in a different kind of way than the pictures coming out of the Brussels summit with President Trump will give her in the run-up to an election in Germany. And the third way that the president's behavior is becoming an international liability is because the United States gains a lot of support for what we try to do internationally because we exemplify the values of a free society. And I think in, in a lot of places, particularly in Europe and North America, where America's closest allies uh, are, that they are nervous about whether we are continuing to be an example that, that people in the world want to emulate. And then Steve Fish, you're in Moscow right now writing a book on Russia for Americans. And is that the perspective that you're seeing there on the ground in Russia? Uh, do average Russians feel, how do they feel about America right now? Well, you have to remember that this is probably the only country in the world where Trump is actually admired and he's portrayed well in the Russian press. The reason is, is that Russian leadership thinks he could be a transformational leader who could lead the United States down a very different path. Russian leaders have this image of the American foreign policy establishment of both parties as being hostile to Russia, hostile to giving Russia a place at the table. And Trump seems completely different. In addition to the fact that he says nice things about Putin, he also doesn't seem to be terribly committed to democracy. And he, he doesn't really stand up, as, as Corey pointed out in her remarks, for, uh, for traditional American values. This is all something that the Russian government delights in. The problem is, is that, of course, uh, Putin and his associates, like most other foreign leaders, want an American leader who at least is stable, who is a little, a little bit predictable. And Trump is not giving that to them. So they're sticking with him right now, hoping that he'll be the kind of leader that can lead the United States out of what they regard as this kind of idealistic, global, pro-democracy stance 
into something that's more kind of a, the real politique type that they like, where hopefully, in their view, the United States will let them be the policemen in Ukraine, kind of, you know, territories close to Russia will come under Russian sway. Um, President Obama, of course, didn't have that kind of view. Most American leaders don't. Um, Trump, because he's so not committed to democracy, not committed to the Western alliance, and because they think that he actually has a much more pro-Russian attitude, well, you know, there's been a lot of there's been a lot of praise of Trump here. Well, um, let, let's get. I want also, since you're there, I want to also get to the issue of um, possible Russian interference in the 2016 presidential election and kind of get that perspective from Russia as you as well. Are you learning any more about possible collusion? I'm not learning much more about possible collusion. This is not the kind of thing that you would hear on the ground here. This would be very secret stuff. Certainly, the interference in the election is something that Russian, Russian leaders will admit to you over a beer. This is something they're proud of. I mean, the idea that, that Russians are denying that this happened is nonsense. Of course, publicly, Putin denies it. But when you get them over beers, they'll say, yeah, I mean, we, we got you. Uh, you know, some of Putin and his people regard this as payback. For all the interference they think the United States um, does in the affairs of other countries, and particularly in Russia, the American government supported the Yeltsin government in the 1990s. They've seen the Americans as interfering in their affairs for some time. So they think this is kind of payback. And Corey, that's, the, that's the perspective from here. And Corey, when President uh, Trump fired James Comey, it was only the second time that an FBI director has been fired in this nation's history. So what kind of impact do you think that will have on the FBI and the Justice Department? Yesterday's announcement that former FBI Director Mueller is being appointed as the, as the special counsel to look into these things is an enormously reassuring decision uh, by the Deputy Attorney General. But I think there is a general sense that, um, that the checks and balances in the American political system are certainly being put to the test. And the good news is they appear to be passing the test, and, and that's an important message for the United States to be sending in the world, that the difference between Russia and the United States is that President Putin and President Trump may have the same kind of authoritarian reflexes, but the institutions and the vibrancy of civil society and the tenaciousness of the American media create a different kind of outcome in the United States than we see in Russia. And that's something much to be grateful for in the United States, but it requires constant vigilance and it requires institutions like the FBI and the attorneys general and the media to continue keeping a very close, very suspicious eye. And, and Steve, how does this compare to Watergate? Are there signs of obstruction of justice here? Of course there are. When, when he fires Comey, who is the director of the FBI, obviously because he's concerned that he's digging in a little too deep. You know, many people would regard that, I certainly do, as obstruction of justice, perhaps not in the strict, strictest sense, but it's certainly a step in that direction. You know, that this is, this is clearly a case of the president trying to interfere with the operations of an agency that presidents traditionally do not interfere with. But Trump does not seem to see any of these lines that other presidents do, nor does he apparently consult with counsel before he does things like try to sway Comey in this direction or that. Other presidents don't do this because they know these rules. Trump doesn't have a clue. And Corey, you, you're a Republican, but you did not support uh, Donald Trump during the presidential campaign. From President Trump's sharing of classified information uh, to the James Comey fallout, how do you think this is affecting the domestic Republican agenda? How disruptive is it? I think it's enormously disruptive. It's very hard to be able to keep party discipline, to be able to have, for the president, to have the political capital to encourage members of Congress to make tough votes and to show that he can protect them if they do, uh, when there's this kind of uh, tumult that the president himself keeps setting off. Yeah, that's certainly true. But the bigger story here about the Republican Party is that we're finding, some, finding out some really very, very disappointing things about it. For the Republican Party and its leaders to continue to stand by this guy 
given all he's been doing and for McConnell and Ryan and other Republican leaders to do this, really raises the question of what the Republican Party's policy on loyalty to country is. It's shocking to think about one of the two major parties in the United States really looking much more like the anti-liberal parties in, in Europe right now um, than, than dedicated to democracy as traditionally the Republican Party has been. I think that's the bigger story. This also means then that civil society, as Corey pointed out, and also the FBI, the bureaucracy, uh, really matter a lot more. The opposition, of course, matters a lot more right now. But none of this would really be that big a problem if Republican leaders showed the least bit of responsibility and concern with the, prob with the problem of governance in the United States. Right now, with rare exceptions, they're just not doing that. And, and Corey, you, you get the last word on this. What do you have to say to what Steve Fish just said? Well, I think a lot of the concerns that people, including myself, are raising are concerns about norms and traditions, not about breach of law. And until breach of law is proven, I think Republicans are going to try and keep moving their conservative agenda forward under this president. Thank you both, UC Berkeley Professor Steve Fish and also Hoover Institution Fellow Corey Shockey. My pleasure. And turning now to an acclaimed journalist who has observed this nation's politics for five decades, Bill Moyers was a longtime news program host on PBS and has made numerous documentaries for the network. Moyers has seen politics from the inside as well. He was a policy advisor and then press secretary for President Lyndon B. Johnson. His latest documentary examines one of the worst jails in America and airs on PBS this month. Bill Moyers, it is delightful to have you in our studio. I'm pleased to be here. <laughs> well, I wanted to ask you about Bob Mueller. This week, former FBI Director Robert Mueller was appointed as special counsel to investigate Russian meddling in the 2016 presidential election. How significant is that move? You could not have picked a, a man with greater credibility among the FBI agents with whom he once served and whom he once led, among members of Congress, Democrats and Republicans who respected his integrity when he was testifying and working uh, back in the days he was FBI director, or with the general public. I think there's a perception that this is, uh, this, this is a man we can trust with this incredible uh, uh, challenge. Obstruction of justice? Do you yes. think there's a basis for that here? It's too early. I, I suspect there is uh, from the behavior of the president and from the stories that have come out. But before you uh, and begin impeachment uh, proceedings, you need to really have the evidence. And that's what I think we will now get with Mueller as head of the, uh, as the independent counselor, and from Comey himself when he is finally called to testify before Congress, which other journalists and friends of mine, former FBI agents, tell me he really wants to do. Mm -hmm. I wanted to also ask you about your, your tenure as a press secretary in the White House for Lyndon B. Johnson. It's been five decades since you've done that. And how would you say the role has evolved over that time? I mean, we watch Sean Spicer, and, and sometimes you, you actually feel sorry for the guy. Yes, I'm sure some people felt sorry for me. I hope they did. <laughs> well, it was a long time ago, and I was only two years as press secretary. My first two years, I was responsible for the domestic policy, and the president went through a couple of press secretaries, and he drafted me against my will. You, you did not want that job. No, I loved what I was doing, working on the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, the War on Poverty, uh, the Higher Education and second, Secondary Education Bill, all of that. I loved that substantive work. The uh, press role is very difficult, and I'm afraid my credibility was such that I couldn't believe my own leaks because I would get caught and trapped in information I didn't know about. The stories were developing as I was trying to answer questions about them, and I often didn't just say, well, I don't know. I tried to fudge an answer. My father, when I became press secretary, an ordinary working man in East Texas, sent me a telegram. Bill, tell the truth if you can, but if you can't tell the truth, don't tell a lie. And I tried to follow that. Sometimes I fell into uh, uh, to, uh, a, a questionable area. It was never intentional. But it was, very, it was very difficult. Johnson was a different man from Trump, although he has some characteristics, paranoia, distrust of the press, uh, ego. Uh, but he was a different man. He understood government. He wanted us to relate the important mm -hmm. information to the press. And there were far fewer media outlets and more traditional media outlets than there are now. Now, as you say, you've got social media, you've got yeah. the conservative press, the right-wing press, you've got uh, Breitbart and all of those competing forces that make it hard to sustain a coherent story. 
You know, we have access to more information now than ever before uh, with the advent of the internet. And, but that also means greater access to fake news. So how can we as journalists combat fake news? Most people, if confronted by a fact that, that subverts their belief system, if it challenges their belief system, they will stay with their belief system. They will not change what they believe uh, to, in order to acknowledge the fact. Why? Because our belief systems sustain us day by day. Uh, our religious views, our political bias, uh, our understanding of science or anything else, we stick with our belief system which supports us in a very turbulent world. And facts can be very disturbing. Facts can upset your worldview. And unless you have the strength within and the assurance of the material, of the, of the, of the information, you tend to cling to what gives you solace, what gives you comfort, what gives you a way of being in the world that's so changing so rapidly that you can hold on to who you are and what you think. That's human nature, but we have to keep as journalists being so insistent that what we're doing is grounded in, 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 in evidence and reality that people in time learn to change their belief systems to fit the reality. You were accused in the past of liberal bias being too, leaning too left. Uh, and now we have a situation with the Trump administration where once again, those types of accusations are being leveled against the media. Do you see similarities here? We are constantly bombarded, not only by information, but by propaganda. Every ad we see on television or in the newspaper is propaganda. It's, it's telling what benefits the buyer of the advertiser by the advertiser. Journalism is much the same way. My complaint with left-wing journalism or right-wing journalism is that it arranges the facts to fit its ideology. Both of them do, but conservatives have developed a vast machine for propaganda. What they do, and I pay a lot of attention to, I've done documentaries on this, what they do is to organize their event, to, their information to, to perpetuate their propaganda. And that's not the role of journalism. I cannot consider them journalists because journalists, as I've say to the boredom of people, is about getting us to verifiable truth. How can we do a better job of that, though? Because we have uh, machinery now, the Fox Network, and Roger Ailes, of course, just passed away this week, but he, he built up the Fox Network into what it is today. And they are constantly telling the same kinds of things that the Trump administration is saying about the rest of the media. So how do you fight that? You know, an organization that has developed a culture of harassment of other people, of women, immigrants, whomever, an organization whose character is formed by a tolerance for uh, humiliating other people and harassing other people cannot be trusted to be delivering the news. You cannot separate the integrity of your broadcast from the integrity of your employees. Bill O'Reilly came after me time and again with a pack of lies. I kept calling and writing him and saying, come on my program and let's discuss this. Let's have an honest discussion about what you're saying. He would never do it. He was a bully hiding in his bunker at Fox News and Roger Ailes created a series of impenetrable bunkers for people who were attacking the rest of the country with impunity. Isn't there room though for a conservative viewpoints? Or network devoted to a conservative viewpoint? Absolutely, but conservative, I, I, do, I see no conservative principles operating within Fox News. I see a destructive tendency and a bullying that goes on it within and without. I wanted to ask you about the uh, audit by the chair of the Corporation for Public Broadcasting back in 2004. And basically uh, a company was hired to analyze uh, political guests on NPR and PBS shows, including your show, Bill Moyers Now. He was looking for liberal bias. Uh, how did you respond at that time? Well, I am a liberal. Uh, I am because I believe we can do more collectively together uh, to improve democracy than we can individually, that we need to work together on some things we cannot do. That makes me a liberal. I am a liberal. I served in two Democratic administrations, the Kennedy and Johnson administration. But a liberal, a Democrat, like a Republican and a conservative, can still do justice to the integrity of the news. Uh, I believe that our job as journalists is to get the audience as close as possible to the verifiable truth. And uh, this gentleman was a partisan Republican, re uh, very loyal to Karl Rove, who did not like what I was reporting on there. I was trying to tell what was happening in Iraq after the war on Iraq. I was trying to put on people who had a different opinion than the, alternative, than the official reality. 
I don't want to let you go without asking you about your new documentary as well, airing on PBS. It's called Rikers, an American Jail. It's about New York City's largest jail. We hear directly in, the, in that documentary from the men and women who have been incarcerated. Why did you decide to make this film? Because mass incarceration has become a scandal, a failure, and a stain on American democracy. Mass incar incarceration has become the sharp edge of racism in this country. It falls most heavily on people of color, people who are poor, and upon young men in particular. African Americans in this country are six times as likely uh, to be arrested as whites. Hispanics in this country are twice as likely to be arrested as whites. It's also become an assault assault on democratic principles of uh, fair play and humanity, and we've got to reform. We were on the way to criminal justice reform before the last election, and now President Trump and Attorney General Sessions have in effect started the war on drugs again, which yeah. sent so many young people to prison. They have the philosophy of throw, you lock them up and throw away the key, so we're re regressing on this very important uh, practice of democracy. One of the lines that stand out for me in that documentary is near the top when you have one of the inmates saying that as you get to that jail, it's like entering the belly of the beast yeah. and that it was so memorable. Bill Moyers, thank you so much. The documentary Rikers and American Jail airs on KQED on Monday at 9 p.m. And we appreciate so much your taking the time to be here with us. Well, thank you for this opportunity. Everyone say, I can't cook, you know, I don't have time to cook. Well, you don't need that much time to cook well. All you need is organization. That's a clip of French chef and cooking show host Jacques Pepin in 1990. He launched his television career here at KQED with a series called Today's Gourmet. Since then, he starred in almost a dozen other TV series with KQED. Now, a new American Masters documentary explores how he has helped change cooking in America. Jacques Pepin, The Art of Craft, premieres next Friday nationally on PBS. KQED's Rachel Myro spoke with Jacques Pepin earlier. Jacques Pepin, what a personal pleasure. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. And I have no stove and no knife. I've <laughs> Where's the chicken? I was hoping to see a deboned chicken. Oh, boy. <laughs> well, this documentary has so many marvelous little details that I think will surprise a lot of people who think they're very familiar with you based on so many cooking shows over the years. I didn't realize that you had cooked for French heads of state, Charles de Gaulle, oh boy. in France. Yeah, someone introduced me a while ago, said that man cooked for three French heads of state and the three of them are dead. You know, that's how it was introduced. Yes, but they <laughs> ate well before they went. <laughs> right. You cooked in New York, you cooked at Le Pavillon, yeah. the Kennedy White House asked you to well, cook for them, right. and yet you chose to go to work for Howard Johnson. Right. Why? Well, you know, if you look at it in the concept of the time, at, the, in the, at that time, you know, the cook was very, very low on the social scale. The cook was in the kitchen. Any good mother wanted her child to marry an architect or a doctor, not a cook. So it was another world altogether. So when I was asked to go to the White House, I did not really, to be truthful, realize the potential of publicity or whatever. And I had done it. Uh, I was in New York. And, uh, but Howard Johnson, on the other end, I would learn about production, marketing, American eating habit, uh, all kind of things that I didn't know anything about. So it was a great, and I stayed there for 10 years, from 1960 to 1970s. Boy, American food post-World War II was such a bizarre world. I thought we might play a little clip from the documentary just to show what it was like for you to walk into a grocery store. Oh, boy, yeah. At the first time that I went to a real supermarket, well, I thought it was a fantastic idea. However, there was basically no vegetable. I remember going there and saying, where are the mushrooms? Aisle 5. Aisle 5 was canned mushroom. I can't even imagine what that must have looked like to you. Yes, in some way, a lot of package, but on the other hand, fantastic beef, lobster, rack of lamb. I mean, so they were very, very expensive in France. That's why people learn how to do stew, to look the lower part of the meat. Yeah, stew was very fancy. No, but steak were very inexpensive. So, you know, yeah, the steak too, there is many things which were absolutely beautiful. Trade-offs, I suppose, but mm -hmm. it does seem as if 
a culture, we are just obsessed with technology. Today, of course, we see it in, in different formats. Silicon Valley startups offering, you know, one-click shopping. Someone else is picking your produce. What do you make of all that? Yeah, but in a sense, you know, it's a deja vu. I remember going with my mother when I was a kid <clears throat> to the market, my two brothers, to help her carry the stuff. Everything was local, everything was organic. You know, I mean, uh, it was before I did, people didn't have fertilizer, it didn't take off fungicide, insecticide, everything was local, organic, simple. So we are going back to that, going around all of that time. And it's kind of fascinating to see, to see you know, what's going on with Young Chef and all that. So uh, the supermarket have never been as beautiful as they have been today, compared to the supermarket, you know, that I was talking about before. I mean, you know, you go the fresh vegetable and the variety. I mean, in New York, there is 24,000 restaurants. You know, so the ethnicity and the type of restaurant that you have, it's just the most exciting, you know, food in the world, I think, is in America now. This conversation would not be complete if we didn't play at least one clip of you and Julia Child. Yeah, absolutely, yes. Today we're going to do souffles. And as everyone knows, the heart of the good souffle is... Egg white, beaten egg white. And I'm going to do mine in copper. I beat it faster than the machine. Well, we're going to see if you're faster than the machine. All right. Let's go. Okay. Wow. Oh, One, yes. two, three, go! You guys were such a great pair. Yeah, it's fun. That's what people have to realize. Cooking is fun. Cooking is being together. Cooking is enjoying life. Cooking, eating, all is part of, a, you know, what humans do, you know. Well, you know, there you were playing at the idea of, of competing, right? Yes. The, the machine versus the man with a whisk. Things have gotten so much more competitive these days. Yes. I don't think competition for me is a good word in the kitchen, uh, in, in a fun way, this way, of course. But there's a great deal of love that you do in your cooking. What's your perfect meal for tonight? Bread and butter. I mean, Bread you know, and <laughs> butter. Ah, uh, Julie would approve. Hard, hard to beat bread and butter when it's really... Great bread and great butter. Thank you so much for talking with us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here. <laughs> I'm hungry now. That does it for us. Next week, we have a special Encore program, Bay Area Innovators, people who are changing the way we learn, play, and feed the hungry. And for more of our coverage, go to kqed.org newsroom. I'm Tui Vu. Thank you for watching.